It's our community, and I'm Mary Davidson. We have the most interesting guests, but today we have a gentleman by the name of Clifford Alfrey. And Clifford lives in Olathe, and he is an actor. I have a whole list of things you are, <laughs> Clifford. He's an actor, he's a wig maker, he's a makeup artist, he's a collector of Dracula-related items, and he's also um, just a general thespian. <laughs> so nice. I think it's wonderful. I don't know where to put this, so we're going to start out with bats in our belfry. This is Eric, and Eric was made uh, by the Stife Company, and he is, as you can see, a bat and part of uh, Clifford's collection, but I didn't know what to do with Eric, but he was so cute that I wanted you to see him. But, the st but it's interesting to note, um, Clifford, that the Stife Company made very few of these, you said? Very few. They made a lot of animals, mostly bears. Most people recognize Stife as Yeah, I told bears. you I had a Stife teddy bear. Yep. Yeah. But very few of Eric. But you have Eric. Mm-hmm. Very rare. We, I think you took, I, I, I don't, what they're worth is not. About but, 600 but bucks. But Eric is it worth <laughs> it. So we need to all look for Stife <laughs> Eric the bats, and we can all get rich. But I just wanted you to see Eric because he's just, he's cute. You are very multifaceted in your hobbies, mm -hmm. Clifford. So let's talk first about Dracula. Why Dracula? I think as a kid I was into horror and sci-fi growing up in the 50s. Of course, we weren't allowed to watch the horror movies because everybody thought it kept you awake at night and dreaming and everything. And it wasn't really until I saw a stage version of Dracula when I was in college that really got me started on thinking about Dracula. Since that time, I've been, I've seen about a dozen productions, stage productions, even saw the Broadway revival in 1970s, and have even directed a couple of productions of it and designed sets and have played Van Helsing. So you're Draculated. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just, you know, people collect a lot of things. Are you interested in the history of Dracula? Some. Well, talk yes. about Dracula a little bit. Well, Dracula was written in 1890, well, it was published in 1897. Mm -hmm. um, Bram Stoker was the author. Mm -hmm. I actually have a letter that's in Bram Stoker's handwriting, and it's dated in 1897, 1898. Um, Bram Stoker was a personal secretary to Sir Henry Irving, who was the manager of the Lyceum Theater. And as his personal secretary, every letter that he, Sir Henry Irving signed, Bram Stoker wrote. So that letter right there is Where in did you memory. find this letter? I actually found it online. It's well documented. Uh, there are several of them out there, uh, letters. It's not Dracula related. The letter itself isn't. But uh, Dracula was based on Vlad Tepes, uh, an actual um, person. But there's a lot of myths and things that they exaggerated on. And in Victorian times, people were always afraid of certain things. Well, the, the Victorians were sort of overwrought exactly. in general. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and everything, uh, disease or something, malaria if it was, suddenly it was a vampire had caused it. So. And we all got a case of the vapors and had to have a smelling salt. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think that's just wonderful. So it has really taken over your life at some point. Well, I guess. Yes. Um, I didn't start collecting till probably 15 years ago, and that's the first piece I collected. It was um, and there, a And there is Clifford's very first piece. It's um, a little glass basket. It's Art Deco with a brass bat on both sides. It's made by the Lotz Glass Company in Austria. And they were in business from the 18, late 1800s to the 1930s. Um, they signed very few pieces of their work, and that was probably 1920. Well, and I then. asked you what was your favorite piece, and you didn't miss a beat, Clifford. <laughs> you said it's the, first the, one. the green basket. Mm -hmm. The first one is always the favorite yep. one. Well, um, you, there are various Dracula movies, and you have, well, bats really abound mm -hmm. in, your, in your collection. There are lots of Dracula mu movies. Which is your favorite one? Well, of course, the first one, which is a, it's very stylized with Bela Lugosi, but I think my favorite Dracula was actually Frank Langella, who was in the Broadway revival and then went on and did a movie in the 1979. Um, the most unusual one was a, um, 
a movie called Dracula 2000 by Wes Craven. Mm -hmm. It had a very interesting premise to it. Um, you did not find out till the end why Dracula was repelled by um, a cross and holy water and the Bible. It's because why Dracula was actually um, Judas. Judas, exactly. Judas who betrayed Jesus. And you do not find that out till the end until this Dracula hangs, gets caught up in a wire sign that said Jesus saves, and it falls over and is strangled, and you see him strangling when he is hung as Judas. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And now they've taken the original Bram Stoker's Dracula and changed it. Changed it. I'd call it crocheted. <laughs> Updated it, I yeah. guess, yes. Isn't that interesting? There's so many different versions of it out there, some of them based on Bram Stoker's novels, some of them not, some of them entirely different. Well, I'm wearing one of Clifford's pieces that you might like to see. That's I, from I the... You may not get this back, Clifford. <laughs> this is lovely. That's I like That's from it. the 1979, uh, 1991 uh, movie, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, mm -hmm. and that was issued to cast members and crew members only. Uh, it was made out of Swarovski crystals. Mm -hmm. The only problem is this person who was in the cast, or the crew, decided they didn't want to keep theirs any longer. So and you it went said, up here I am. I got it. I think that's wonderful. Um, you think that the 1897 Dracula is the scariest? At, for its time, the, the 1931 movie with Bela Lugosi was, for its time, very scary. They even uh, set up nurses in the audience at the movies really? uh, to get people who might have fainted from the scenes, you know. Well, I know that you have a life mask uh, of Bela Lugosi. Yes. It, and let's talk about him just a little bit. Bela Lugosi was not the, he was the first one to play it on the stage in America, but he was not the first choice to play it in the movie. They actually wanted Lon Chaney to play um, Dracula. Uh -huh. Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces, who yeah. had played Phantom of the Opera and Hunchback of Notre Dame. However, he died before they started filming and they decided to pull in Bela Lugosi. He was, I, 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 you know, we looked at the, at the, the mask and there he is right down there. We looked at, he's a really small man. He really is. He was a very short in statue. I think he even wore he, uh, heels on his shoes just to make him appear taller right. for stage productions, so. But he was scary guy. <laughs> yes, I, he was cursed by playing that role. He was typecast was he? for playing that and other, and he had to play it on stage many times after the movies came out. Clifford loves bats, and I, 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 I'm just fascinated with all these neat things that you have. I want to take a minute and look at this. Isn't that pretty? Originally, I thought that was a belt buckle, but is it, See, I it's, think uh, it's a class comes apart. for a cloak or a cape that a woman wore. Very art deco, it went at the top and you and could... And then you could undo it here. Exactly. I just think that's the neatest thing. Where do you find this stuff, Clifford? Um, antique shows, flea markets, uh, antique shops, malls, online, auctions. I do have two props with me. The This uh, pewter oh, the small candlesticks. candlestick the candlesticks, is yes. actually used in the Bela Lugosi movie in 1931. Uh -huh. Pewter, it's very soft and brittle. The other one, a wrought iron candlestick. The was taller one, the shorter one was the 1931 right. movie. Uh -huh. And the taller one was from the 1991 Francis Ford Coppola Dracula. That's where the pin came mm -hmm. from. Isn't that, but it looks like it's hand forged even. I don't, don't know. So. Don't it might so. be, might not be. And you found those? Um, both of them online. You told me a secret, and that is that you're up to the eyeballs in Dracula stuff. I do. I only collect, a, oh, once in a while I find something very unusual that I have to have. The rest of the time, not. <laughs> well, you have something I think is really unusual. This is my favorite. It's a little Victorian inkwell. inkwell. Look, it's another. With the bat. There's the bat. Oh, there goes the Look, lid. There it, goes the lid. It's all right. But it's okay. And here goes, there's the bat. 
yep. and dropping all this mm -hmm. stuff. There's and the that bed. would be the tray that holds the pen so it doesn't uh -huh. um, leak onto the paper. Mm -hmm. And then you dip it in the glass inkwell. Well, I just... <laughs> You also, um, we were talking about Bella Lugosi, who was a scary guy, but he was also famous for makeup and, and becoming scary. Right. So one of your other talents is makeup and wigs. Yes. And you made a moose. I made a moose head. Uh, every time they would need a special or unusual prop, and this was when, when I lived in Topeka, uh -huh. uh, the community theater would call me and say, look, we need such and such. And they were doing a show called Evil Dead the Musical. Uh -huh. And it takes place in a lodge. And suddenly the lodge is haunted and all of everybody becomes a zombie. But the moose head suddenly on the wall starts talking. <laughs> so they asked if I could create one. So uh, it took me about is. a week. And I created it. And the mouth does move. It was with a cord that was run off stage. And it was mounted on the wall, and they would tug on it every time they had to speak. I love it. Did he say anything exciting? Oh, no. It was, it was all <laughs> Loose scripted. Talk. It was all scrap, talk. scripted, kind of like um, <laughs> old Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> when, you, when you make wigs, mm -hmm. do you use human hair? No, I don't create a lot of wigs from scratch. I usually take wigs that are there and, and alter them in some way. Yeah. I think when we were doing... Um, a version of Man of La Mancha, the person who had to play Don Quixote had a matter of like two or three minutes to change and become Don Quixote on stage. Uh -huh. So we took a woman's wig and cut it because it had to be gray and wiry and he needed bushy eyebrows. So what we did is we made a stocking cap out of nylon hose and painted the forehead wrinkles on it, glued the, the eyebrows on it, and because it was stretchy, it stretched to his skin, and every time he would move his eyebrows up, the, the fake ones would, would move. move with it too. And he could literally just throw that on <laughs> and not have to do any makeup, and he changed to that. I got to tell you something, though, Clifford. I don't want you to give me anything that I have to put on that makes more wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> I, years ago, I was in a play, um, I think it was um, Harvey, uh -huh. and I was painting wrinkles oh. in my face. Oh. And another lady was painting wrinkles out, out of, of her, her face. And I said, <laughs> you want to switch roles? <laughs> That's right. I think one of the most interesting ones you did was Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. Now, I didn't actually do the play. I did the makeup. Yeah, I'm talking about that, um, yeah. The costume they purchased, and it had a wig and a, a beard. But the makeup itself, they asked me to create. Uh -huh. And rather than have to just paint it on, we decided to go with a three-dimensional makeup. And we purchased it online, and then the only problem with a foam latex piece is that when you add makeup to it, it deteriorates. And so after oh, because so the many foam stuff gets kind of yeah. mushy. And after uh -huh. so many Cracks performances, off. you have to get a new one. Yeah. So what we did is we created a mask with it, uh, a fabric mask, and glued it with a flexible glue with this foam latex. And then we painted the foam latex with an acrylic paint. Just an acrylic craft paint. Do you sew? Can a you, little bit. So you um, can not good, but a little but bit. But you can do it enough to mm -hmm. make the thing stick together. And that yeah. way he could reuse the mask over and over again and it was held on with elastic and velcro in places. And it was quite comfortable. When you when you do this to people, <laughs> this transformation, if you will, is it difficult for them? Or do you find them fitting it, changing their personality when the makeup goes on? Tell me, Sometimes they that. do. Not all actors do, but some people do. I played Merlin one time in a production of um, Camelot. Uh -huh. And it took me an hour and a half to put on the makeup. Now, I look nothing like Merlin. I have a short, fat, round face, <laughs> and Merlin is very slender. <laughs> so it took a lot of makeup. I had fake bags under the eyes, a fake nose, fake eyebrows, fake mustache, mm -hmm. fake yeah, beard, yeah, fake yeah. wig. And after you got it all done, you were Merlin. Yeah. You, you couldn't be anybody else. You, you didn't feel comfortable talking in your normal voice. You wanted to play someone older. So it does age you. Just so you didn't try to make gold out of the base metals. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not didn't tried try that, that yet, no. Actors are very interesting people because they do better in someone else's skin. Exactly. Um, and also, you're 
scripted. You're reading things that were written for you. I've gotten awards before for Best Supporting Actor, but I always say, you know, it's not just me. It's the playwright, it's the costumer, it's the makeup artist, it's the lighting, it's the sound, everything together that makes me what I am. And you have to realize it's not just one person. But you know, you're kind of an interesting person in that you have not, you have not made a living doing all of no. these wonderful things. You. I worked for the state for uh, 25 years and retired. Did you always do this on the side? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. so. But you, did you, co how, how long have you been collecting Dracula material? About 15 years. Oh. So. Well, yeah. so you have always had this kind of overriding hobby that your job fed. Right, right. Now, one of the, my favorite roles, now, although I, I like horror and sci-fi, one of my favorite roles I, I do is I play comedies. Uh -huh. And my favorite show was Greater Tuna and the sequel, um, the Tuna, Tuna Christmas, Christmas yes. in which the, there are 22 characters in each show, all played by two actors. And you did, and, and Dan, uh, Stanley Boo Miller? Stanley, Stanley Boo Miller and, and then Dixie Dewberry. Dixie Dewberry. Um, are, are both men and the, Well, no? Dixie is a woman. Oh, Dixie is. With 22 characters, we played men. But Dixie started, was not really a woman. Wasn't it the same yes. person that played both? Same them? person. Yeah, played. yeah. But uh, we played men, women, children, and in, greater, in a Tune of Christmas, we played even midgets. Or I guess politically correct, it would be little people. Yes. Um, we had fun. It was quick changes, quick costume changes. You throw on a wig, you throw on something, and you go back on. Uh, although there were 22 characters, sometimes we changed costumes back and forth. There was probably around 40 costume changes in the in the and show. And do you rent, mostly rent the costumes? You no, we had a costumer. She provided everything. Everything was Velcroed. We would kind of go backstage and put our arms out and the dressers would just rip stuff on and slap stuff on and we'd go back on stage with someone else. Are you still doing this? I The last play I did was in July. Oh, uh, well, we, so you're still... Well, but that was in Topeka. Now I've moved to... Olathe. Olathe. I haven't done anything here yet. Well, does it, Olathe has a community Olathe theater. Olathe has a community theater. I haven't started anything yet. Um, I'm waiting for the right comedy to come along, <laughs> I guess. So you, you're th are you through with sci-fi and scaries? Well, I still collect that, and I still love that. I still will go to see anything uh -huh. like that. But I always act and in comedy. Why do you like scaries? Um, I, when I was younger, I, was, I dabbled in stage magic and uh, ventriloquism and clowning. So, and I knew stage illusions, and in Dracula and, and um, horror and sci-fi things, they use a lot of illusions on stage, and I knew, I had a, a background of magic, so I knew how things were created. Although the audience would see something and be amazed, I knew the background of how something was done. And so it was of great interest to you, yeah. technically. Yes, too. exactly. Well, you t were telling me about uh, blood. The creation of blood. We had to create blood uh, on stage for Dracula and Evil Dead the Musical. The problem is the most formulas for blood or that you either buy made up or you make your own stains clothing really bad. So the costumer, it was a nightmare for them. And especially if someone wore white and someone had to bite them on the neck and then the dye would... They it's were, they they were use, forever bitten on the neck. <laughs> it was because they used red food coloring, yeah. the dye in it, yeah. and it does not come out. So what we did is we used a soap base. I think Dawn Dish Soap has a red, and we added a little bit of blue food coloring, and then to make it a little bit more thicker, some um, tempera paint, which also is washable. So when you, the blood did run down, it was actually washable because there was soap in it. Back to your days of Merlin. Yeah, exactly. So all you had to do was just <laughs> rinse it and already wash it in regular laundry. But, but you were telling me about, in the, was it the old movie that they used chocolate syrup? Exactly. They did for blood because in black and white it showed up best as chocolate syrup. But in The Wizard of Oz, and I just w learned that recently, when they used the Tin Man, the oil can, uh -huh. oil would not photograph. So they used chocolate syrup in it to look like oil. So. <laughs>
but, everything but, isn't as it seems, you know. No, it is not. That that's the kind of the story of life, is yep. it not, Clifford? Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Um, how do you feel? Do you? Somebody said to me once that it was a most interesting thing to step into someone else's skin to g say someone else's words. Are you a writer as well? Sometimes, sometimes people don't like to do that. They like to to provide the skin and the words. I. I am not much of a writer. I have written a few little things, never published. Um, I have done some ad-libbing when we're in rehearsals and the director will say, oh, I like that, let's do that. But you have never felt the need to provide the skin. No, I, I prefer to use other people's it's other people's, words. other people. But you know, you have not always um, created your characters on the stage. You've done radio as well. Well, we do what's called staged radio dramas. Um, Back in the early days, before television, and they had first they had stage, and then when they had electric radio, everything was done on the radio. Dramas, soap operas, um, music, everything was done. Mysteries. So everything was done with the voice. And at that time, the actors came into a studio, and they read from a script. They had live musicians, and they had a sound effects crew. We recreated that. Um, you did us a, a wonderful life, didn't you? Yes, yeah. there was a, a local playwright in Topeka who has published works, and he wrote a, a version of It's a Wonderful Life for radio. And we did it in, a, in front of uh, live audiences, and then we did it in a studio at KTWU, which is a public television station there, and broadcast it at Christmas time. We also did two Halloween shows. One was Twisted Tales of Edgar Allan Poe, and the other Back one, to the scaries again, Clifford. <laughs> and the other one was um, Hound of the Baskervilles. I got uh -huh. to play one of my favorite roles also was Dr. Watson. Oh, so. yeah. Are you a, um, a um, fan of uh, I, Sherlock? And I Dr. am, and I like public television versions of... I do too. And the actor who played um, Sherlock Holmes in the public television series actually played Dracula in the London version. Really? Yes. Yes. That's really. Jeremy Brett was Jeremy the Jeremy Brett. Name. That's yep. right. That's right. Um, so you're not you're not stuck with uh, Dracula. You like all of these kind of um, scary mystery things. Actually, yes. And a few years back, our community theater did a production of Frankenstein, and mm -hmm. they asked me to create the makeup for the monster. And I know you did that. I did that, and the actor that they had cast was, and you won't believe this, but he is actually seven foot, seven inches tall. I saw a picture of you with him. Well, it wasn't me with him. With somebody with him. Yes. A regular sized person. A person who was six foot tall standing next to a person who was seven foot, seven How'd inches tall. How'd you find tall. that guy? Well, his brother was uh, volunteered a lot at the theater, and he told him, he says, you know, they're doing this production of Frankenstein, you should go audition. He had never been in a play before. And went and auditioned. So the that's director sort of a said, backhanded compliment. The You're so said, tall, you should go. You. Yeah. So. Isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. You you know, we're talking about the radio plays. Is it different to be an actor in a radio play than it is in oh, a... Oh, definitely, because well, everything is done with the voice. And that means, and the radio, since they didn't see you, you could play multiple characters. When we did It's a Wonderful Life, I originally played uh, Clarence, with an old man's voice, and then I did um, Uncle Billy, which I kind of channeled a little bit Edgar Buchanan. Well, you know, my uncle, he's got a kind of a raspy voice. And then I actually played a little kid uh, in high school with kind of the days of little nerd type character. So I played three <laughs> characters. Now, seeing me on camera, it's still me there, yes. but if you just listened to it, you would see, you would hear three oh, different sure. people. Oh, yeah. And then the sound effects people are just wonderful. That's wonderful. We had a wonderful crew for sound effects. And there were certain sound effects you're trying to, f we didn't want to do anything recorded. Uh -huh. We were trying to figure out how to, fig to make a cab that was running, because we had to use it in what, It's a Wonderful Life, and then it would idle. Well, there was, the only thing <laughs> we could do was find a recording, but what we ended up doing was the sound effects person researched it and she put a fan with the old metal blades, put it inside of a tub and pushed the sides of the tub in. And then she had a rheostat on the <laughs> fan. 
So the blades would go around and hit the sides of the fan and make a and then she could muffle it with a lid. And when it was going it sounded like a car idling and when she sped it up it was like the car was leaving. Isn't that so funny? And yet your your when your you ear was it, tricked okay. and it sounded like a car moving. Well, a lot of times what happens on the stage is a trick. Exactly. It, it's an illusion. An illusion, yes. Uh, you're not that person. It could be done an illusion with uh, a set, with lights, uh, with makeup, with costume, or just the person themselves. Don't you think that's why people enjoy plays and movies and even acting because Life is hard sometimes. It is, and that's why I enjoy comedies so much, and uh, at least acting in them, because mm -hmm. comedies you get an immediate feedback from the audience. You get that laughter, you know you're doing it right. In a drama, you don't get laughter. And you, if somebody was crying, you wouldn't hear their crying. Maybe at the end of the show you might hear their applause, but that's it. That immediate gratification back that they're laughing, you're doing something. Have you ever said something funny and it fell like a lead balloon, Clifford? Yes, there's, <laughs> there's certain lines in shows that you think are just hilarious and you say them and the audience doesn't get it at all. And there's other things that you say, oh, I don't get this or it's not funny and the audience just loves it. <laughs> so who knows? Who knows? <laughs> but isn't that wonderful? Something it, appeals to somebody's funny bone someplace. Exactly, and I think comedy it's good to get away from all of the humdrum and the office and serious things in life or bad things at home and then suddenly go and see a light comedy and just turn things around for a while, get some laughs. So what are you going to do going forward? Well, I hope to find a good comedy once in a while. What would you like? If you could choose one, what would you do? I've done so many Neil Simon shows, it's not even funny so you anymore. you would like to do another one? I've done uh, Odd Couple at least three times. Um, as a matter of fact... Which one I'm, are you? I usually play Vinny. And the last time we did it, Governor Bill Graves played Vinny opening night, and then I played it the rest of the run. Oh, how fun. And he was very good, actually. He had done some theater. I think that's so. one. And you've met some wonderful people. I have. I'm not... I've not done anything with big movie stars, although I, my only brush with fame is we did uh, It's a Christmas Carol, and I did have the opportunity to play Marley's Ghost opposite Gordon Jump, who was uh, Mr. Carlson on WKRP in Cincinnati. So, But you know what, Clifford? You don't have to be famous to be a wonderful no, person. No. You really don't. And I, I was li I found a quote. Martha Graham says, the center of the stage is where I am. Exactly. And that's where you are, Clifford. Thank you. <laughs> and I have to say that the diamonds and the rubies of your life, Clifford, have been in the theater. And you are a thespian, an artist, and a collector, and a general great guy. And I would like to say thank you so much, Clifford Alfrey, for coming, bringing your, your treasures to share with us, and allowing us to meet you. So thank you for being with us. I'm Mary Davidson, and it's our community. Isn't it wonderful? It's a wonderful life, Clifford. <laughs>